Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hewitt Shaw, the President of the Board of Directors of the City Club. Today I am pleased and uh, to uh, welcome and introduce to you Professor Karen Mossberger, uh, currently at the University of Illinois in Chicago, but literally on her way uh, as we speak almost to Arizona to become the uh, next director, I think beginning Monday, of the School of Public Affairs at Arizona State University. Professor Mossberger will speak with us today about the issue of internet and broadband access in our cities. Most of us take for granted our access to the internet and other digital communication tools. Indeed, we can't imagine conducting our business or personal lives without those necessities, no longer thought of as mere conveniences or luxuries. Unfortunately, that access is not universal and is lacking in many geographic areas and not available to large segments of our society. A recent study in Northeast Ohio conducted by Professor Mossberger uh, along with a team from the University of Iowa and Rutgers University revealed that one-third of adults in Cleveland and the inner rig suburbs still do not have broadband internet access in their homes. That lack of access also affects many rural and agricultural areas uh, across the country and across the board negatively impacts those folks' basic ability to function and succeed in our 21st century world. Professor Mossberger is an expert on digital inequality, e-government, and urban policy. Her 2012 book, Digital Cities, the Internet, and the Geography of Opportunity, examines this important issue and the potential to expand broad broadband use in our cities. The survey conducted by Professor Mossberger and her team found that the majority of those without access are senior citizens, the economically disadvantaged, and folks of lower educational levels, further limiting that group's ability to assimilate into the world around them. To further study this important issue, the City Club has teamed up with One Community, a nonprofit organization that owns and operates an ultra high speed fiber optic broadband network covering almost 2,000 miles in Northeast Ohio improving the capabilities of more than 2,300 connected institutions like hospitals, schools, libraries, and government offices. Together, one community and the City Club will present a series of five speakers over six months to address this topic with Professor Mossberger today providing our inaugural presentation. Please join me now in welcoming to the City Club pro, uh, uh, podium, Professor Karen Mossberger. Thanks for that kind introduction. And I want to say that I'm truly honored to be invited back here to speak to you today. And I say invited back because I know Northeast Ohio well, having been at Kent State University for eight years, where I taught public policy and public administration and urban policy. So it's been especially rewarding for me and also for my colleague Carolyn Tolbert from the University of Iowa, who was also with me at Kent State, to work with one community to do research on information technology use in Cuyahoga County. Um, like others nationally, we have a lot of respect for the work that one community is doing. They're doing some things that, you know, are truly um, amazing on the national scale. It's also a special honor to be here at the City Club because of the long and distinguished history that the City Club has of fostering dialogue on important policy issues. And it so well represents the proud tradition of civic engagement that the Cleveland area has more generally. I want to begin with just a few numbers, a comparison. There are some challenges to talking about a lot of numbers without PowerPoint. Uh, so, <laughs> So I'm going to try to just use a few and emphasize them a bit. Places often benchmark themselves against others, and so I'm going to start there. We found that 63% of Cuyahoga County residents had broadband at home with this survey from last October. 
We also studied differences within the county, though, clustering together Cleveland and nine inner ring suburbs that had at least a quarter of the population receiving food stamps. So within this inner core, what we call the inner core of the county, only 55% had broadband at home. That's an 8% difference. And this tells a story about uneven adoption of broadband or high-speed networks within the county. But there's a new number that came out just this week from the federal government from a survey um, done by the Bureau of the Census. And that was also conducted in October 2012, the same time as our Cuyahoga survey. Nationally, then, 72% of the population had broadband at home in comparison with 63% in Cuyahoga County surveys at the same time and 55% in the inner core of the county. The central part of the county, then, is about 17 percentage points behind the rest of the nation. And I think these numbers are a concern for the region and I want to talk about why this is so. So why should policymakers care about information technology in their regions? Quite simply, because today information technology is fundamentally changing the way we do everything. Think about how we apply for jobs. How do we file taxes, compare prices, look for a new apartment? Schools increasingly post all of the information for parents about what's going on in the classroom online. Internet use is necessary to participate in society for access to information on jobs, government services, health care, for civic engagement, for economic opportunity. Information and communication online are so essential that the United States the United Nations has called internet access a human right. And the Cuyahoga study, as well as other research we've done, shows that broadband access at home, or high-speed connectivity, is important for the regular and effective access to the internet and the skills to use it that are critical for truly participating in society. Mobile access is an important part of the picture, but it doesn't replace the functionality of broadband at home. I'll talk about that a little more in a few minutes. Mobile devices are changing the way we go online, but they're not erasing technology disparities. So again, why should this be a public policy concern for the region? There's an equity issue, talked about internet use as a human right. But the use of digital technologies also generates spillover benefits that reach beyond the individuals who use them to affect their communities and the broader society. They create what economists call public goods or social benefits. Recognizing this, in 2010, the Federal Communications Commission established a national broadband plan, and it lists a number of goals for the use of high-speed technologies. Civic participation, public safety, community development, health care delivery, energy efficiency, education, job creation, and economic growth, among other national purposes. Broadband is this enabling technology that can affect all of these areas. But in listening to that list of goals, it's apparent that much of this is going to be achieved at the local and the regional level and not in Washington. We have, in fact, what's a collection of metropolitan economies rather than a single national economy. And education, public safety, and many aspects of health care really depend on local governments or on the community anchor institutions um, that are local. And as the Brookings Institution has argued, it's the metropolitan regions that are drivers of the economy and innovation. The Cleveland metropolitan region is in many ways very well positioned to exploit the benefits of broadband and information technology. 
Cities like Cleveland, we argued in our book you mentioned, are storehouses of knowledge and culture with world-class universities and centers for health research. Certainly that's true here. Um, and they're important for the information age economy. With their density, major cities and metropolitan areas have more complex networks of economic activity and labor markets that are more specialized. This facilitates knowledge spillovers and the spread of new applications. So research has shown that technology use in cities and metro areas generates greater productivity and higher wages and more. And these are the areas where the development of broadband innovation is occurring. And economists say that it's important in all sectors of the economy, not just IT. So earlier this week, I was at a national conference in Chicago uh, called, for an organization called US Ignite. And one of the things that was showcased there were healthcare, information, uh, healthcare innovations and new platforms that were created by the Cleveland Clinic and Case Western University. And these were featured as on the cutting edge and really harbingers of the future of the internet. These technologies can lead to new startups, but also lower the costs of healthcare and save lives, achieve some of those really important national purposes. But innovation in a region alone is not enough. The social benefits of technology depend on widespread use and inclusive networks. The value of high-speed networks and applications increases with their use. Regions that have lower rates of internet use and greater inequality are constrained in a number of ways. The skills in the local workforce, the ability of governments to deliver services online more efficiently and effectively, in the capacity of local hospitals to promote preventive care through patient information, in the ability of schools to transform K through 12 education. Local institutions can't move fully into the digital age when the populations they serve are offline or are less connected. Increasingly, jobs even for less educated workers require some kind of computer or internet skills. So in this recent book that I did with Professor Tolbert on digital cities, we compared internet use across the 50 largest cities in the US and their balanced suburban areas, and we ranked them. The surrounding suburbs, so this is from 2009, there's a little time lag. The surrounding suburbs for the Cleveland, Elyria, Mentor, Metropolitan area ranked about in the middle, 22nd in 2009. But the city of Cleveland ranked 47th in broadband use for these 50 largest cities, just behind Detroit and a little ahead of Buffalo, which was last. At the same time then that the Cleveland area is forging ahead with innovative new uses of technology and it, uh, in health and in other areas, it has relatively fewer residents who can access that healthcare information online and fewer residents likely to have the skills needed for today's economy. This is so, especially in Cleveland and other low-income communities in the region. It was true in 2009 and it continues to be true today in comparison with the nation. There are other policy implications from the Cuyahoga County research that we did. So just briefly, before I discuss these, let me say a few words about how we did this study, because I'm sure you're going to ask. In October 2012, we did a random sample telephone survey of more than 1,200 Cuyahoga County residents. We called both landlines and cell phones and did interviews in English and in Spanish. Um, as I mentioned, we oversampled Cleveland and these nine inner ring suburbs to capture the experiences of those who are most likely to be affected by what we call the digital divide. But it also provides an important indicator of differences in need across communities within the region. And prior research shows that low-income communities, in, in these communities, it's really affordability that's the key barrier. Um, the problem's income, often compounded by a lack of skills. 
So one community worked with us to develop a unique set of questions relevant for social services and for K through 12 education. And for this reason, I think that um, the Cuyahoga study that we did has national significance because of these unique questions and that it provides a model for future research on the impact of digital inequality. Um, I started my talk with some figures on broadband at home. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about that for a moment because that's what represents full connectivity to the internet. Um, there are many who are completely offline here uh, who don't use the internet at all. That's about one in five Cuyahoga County residents, one in four for the inner county. That means, though, that in both areas, close to 20% of residents are less connected. They may go to libraries, they may use smartphones, they're connected in some fashion, but don't necessarily have regular or full access. Um, smartphone use, we found here, and it's true nationally, is higher among African Americans, especially in the inner core communities and among Latinos overall in Cuyahoga County. But that's not closing the disparities in access. Most smartphone users of all racial and, e and ethnic groups have home broadband as well. Only 6% of county residents are smartphone only internet users. So this is a relatively small group. But they have some distinctive characteristics. They look like other disadvantaged groups, but they're younger. Mobile-only users tend to be African-American, Latino, young, and low-income. Uh, for example, 11% of respondents in the inner core who have a household income of 20,000 or less here are smartphone-only internet users. So why is it that they're not closing the gap even for this small group of adopters. As you'll see in the Cuyahoga study and in our analysis of data from Chicago and nationally, individuals with home broadband are more likely to perform a variety of activities online, including those human capital and enhancing activities for jobs and education and health. Smartphones have some advantages for activities online, but they're less likely to facilitate reading uh, intensive or writing intensive activities, filling out forms or reading material that's not formatted for phones. And in other studies, we've shown that smartphone only users have less knowledge and skill, um, uh, even when we control for differences in education and other factors. So there are many, many numbers in this report on differences across demographic groups within the county, on percentages who engage in different activities online. Um, overall, however, the inner core is behind the rest of the county except for, in some cases, for mobile access. So I'm going to refer you to the report to if you'd like to explore some of those specifics, I hope that they'll be useful for planning and policy making. Um, but I want to focus on just a few areas today before finishing, on social services and on education, because they demonstrate the impact of these technology inequalities. So local governments can use the internet to deliver more cost effective and more efficient services, but the extent to which they're able to do that depends on whether the residents that they serve are online. Um, with advice from one community, we included questions about 14 different social programs in the survey um, to find out whether what percentage of recipients were online for those different services. And there was a range. So those who were in Ohio work first and employment connection um, were most likely to have broadband. It's important for them for searching for jobs. But there are still some big gaps because in the inner core, still four in 10 of the people who are recipients of those programs did not have broadband at home. As you might expect, 
the lowest rates of internet access at home, of broadband at home, were for seniors, for those in the senior disabled pass, for RTA. And seven in 10 of those um, recipients lacked broadband access at home. Some of the lowest rates of broadband access, though, were for participants in SSI, for Social Security disability, and for Medicaid. Uh, over 60% of those participants lacking broadband at home. Um, for many of the other services, it was over 50%. So putting services online means not only cost savings, but better information, availability around the clock. For recipients, it means uh, less need to spend time traveling to offices and waiting in line. Agencies can share information better. Apart from this, though, if the clients of these programs have internet access at home, they have um, resources to transition from these safety net programs to jobs that can pay a living wage. They have resources that are important for the mission of these programs. Uh, for achieving better outcomes for recipients and society. So research has long shown that parental engagement is important for educational outcomes, for income, uh, I'm sorry, for individuals and for communities. And today schools are opening their classrooms virtually so that both school and home can be better connected in the learning process. In our survey, we found that 68% of Cuyahoga County parents have used the school's website. But the vast majority who did this, almost 90%, had home broadband. We see similar patterns for emailing teachers, for use of uh, homework websites, instructional websites. Parents of children under 18 are among the most um, frequent adopters of broadband at home, but still in the inner core communities, 28% of those don't have broadband at home. So that affects the extent to which experiments with flipped cla classrooms and, and more personalized online instruction can be implemented. Um, disparities in home access constrain the extent to which schools can be transformed and to which parents can be part of that educational process. This threatens to magnify existing inequalities in education and human capital development in the region. So I just want to close by saying that internet use touches all of these areas and it's a core concern for policymakers. The landscape is changing. There are going to be more mobile technologies and the rollout of gigabit networks is, is beginning. We should celebrate this innovation that's occurring in the Cleveland region and around the country. It'll improve the ways in which we live and work. We should embrace that future. But to realize the full potential of that future in our public institutions and in our economy to create vibrant regions we need broad and inclusive networks of technology use connecting our communities. The roadmap to innovation, ubiquitous technology, gigabit networks, this has to include a pathway for changing the opportunities for those who today are disconnected or less connected. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Professor Karen Mossberger, the premier national researcher in the field of digital divide and broadband access in our cities. We will return momentarily for our traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate your questions now and remind you that your questions should be brief and in the form of a question. We welcome all of you here today and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, and one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University 
and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Today's program is the first in a series presented in partnership with one community entitled Broadband, Understanding the Fiber of Our Region, an exploration of the impact of broadband in education, health care, and economic development. Today's program is sponsored by Fifth Third Bank. Please refer to your printed program for information on the other programs in the series. The next program will be on August 9th, featuring Stephen Liber, President and CEO of the Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society. For more information about our upcoming forums, to make a reservation or to order a CD or DVD of any of our programs, please refer to our website, www.cityclub.org. Today is the Tom E. Bloom Memorial Forum on Overlooked Citizens in the Inner City, made possible by a generous gift from the friends of Thomas Bloom to the City Club Endowment. We welcome today guests at tables hosted by Baker Hostetler and One Community. Thank you for your support. Now we would like to return to our City Club speaker for the traditional question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are Carrie Miller, Program Director, and Volunteer Spencer Keisel. May we have the first question, please? Professor, I'll accept everything you say about the lack of connectivity uh, and the disparity of uh, that contact in the inner city and inner ring suburbs. What I did not hear, and this is at the risk of asking you to use up the rest of your time, <laughs> to get a computer, an iPad or a computer, it's anywhere from 500 to a couple thousand dollars, to maintain that connectivity is at least $50 a month. How do you propose, what programs are you advocating to put the means into the hands of people who are on welfare or on Social Security and have no income that they can afford to spend on these devices? Well, I think both of those costs are important. We find in some of our research that often people, though about a quarter of people who don't have broadband at home, have some sort of computer, a working computer at home, but can't afford um, that monthly payment for, um, for the connectivity. Uh, both are important, though. There's you know, an upfront cost in purchasing the computer as well that many low-income families can't afford because of you know, other expenses necessary for survival. So both of those are important and there are a number of programs. I think some one community is an example, but there are a number of programs that do help families to um, address both issues. But we know from the research that it's that continuing monthly payment that's often um, a real problem over time. And we also know that in the US, compared to many of the other um, developed countries and even some of the developing countries, broadband here is relatively expensive. It's often slower than in other places and it's often relatively expensive compared to many other countries. So um, it's that barrier of affordability that um, moving the needle on that, I think, would make uh, a difference. That's what our research shows, especially for low-income communities. Dr. Mossberger, thank you for your comments today, um, and certainly for your research. It's very valuable. Um, somebody told me recently, it's not the device that's mobile stupid, it's the people. And in a world where we're all moving around, and certainly there's mobile access in virtually everywhere that we look, um, the percentage of time that we're actually in one spot or we're using our mobile devices or our mobile hardwired devices uh, or our hardwired access devices uh, is becoming less and less. How is that affecting the future of high-speed access, 
the future of, of access to um, to broadband and how is that affecting the access and the numbers that you're seeing today? How do you predict the numbers will look in the future as that becomes more available? Good question. Thanks. So. Um, Mobile access is important, and it does enrich what we can do. It's the always-on, you know, continually available internet. And as someone who has been living in Chicago and taking public transportation, you know, you want your cell phone to see is the bus coming, or, or you know, to see that the bus is not coming. Maybe you know, but anyway, you know where you stand and how long you're going to be out in the cold. So there are a lot of things you can do on mobile technologies you know, that we couldn't do if we just relied on a desktop at home. And one of the problems, however, is there are some of those important human capital at enhancing activities. In a discussion the other day, taking an online class, for example, that it's pretty hard to do on a smartphone. Having said that, the, the ideal situation is to have both, and those are really the people who are most fully connected, who have access to mobile technologies and to desktops or laptops. It's not so much just the hardwiring, but you know the functionality of a laptop or a desktop for doing some of these other activities. So we really need a variety of devices to um, you know, exploit the full potential of the internet. While I talked about some of the limitations of smartphones, we have done some comparisons, not in this study, but elsewhere, where we looked at people who relied on smartphones to go online versus those who had no personal access and maybe went to libraries or the homes of friends and relatives. And so there's kind of a continuum. People with no personal access um, use the internet least and perform these Human, human capital enhancing activities at lower rates. Um, smartphones actually provide a step up, so people do use them to read news online, which is important for knowledge and civic engagement. Um, in the Chicago study, but not in national data, we found that smartphone-only users controlling for other factors were more likely to look for jobs online. They might not be filling out forms, but it gives them this continuous email access, which they want to know if they're getting contacted. So again, you know, it represents kind of a step forward in some ways for people who may have been much more disconnected before. But it's not enough to say, oh, the problem's resolved and, and you know, this isn't an issue. It's that you talked about mobile devices not being stupid. So this is not only a matter of access, it's not a matter of stupidity, it's a matter of skills and experience and familiarity with the technology. And, you know, all of this is important. And if you have multiple access in multiple venues, the research shows you gain more knowledge and skills, and you do more things online. Professor Mossberger, uh, you spoke about the very positive effects of the widespread use of information technology. Uh, occasionally, there are some negative aspects. And just in the past uh, month, uh, we've learned how an employee of Booz Allen, uh, Edward Snowden, uh, used information technology, which was confidential, uh, to uh, to provide that information uh, outside of the uh, uh, his, his organization to uh, public sources at possible great danger to our security. My question is, uh, uh, I know this is quite different from your the general concept of your talk, but with your knowledge of the uh, information technology, what steps you think can be taken uh, both uh, and, uh, with Booz Allen, uh, which is a private contractor, you know, with individuals uh, to try to prevent uh, this kind of thing from happening again. Okay. Um, let me answer that a little more generally. I think this is a more general point that's really important that any technology, information technology, other technologies, aren't in and of themselves, um, you know, wholly positive or negative, it depends on how they're used. And so, again, you know, 
promoting the kinds of uses that benefit society. This includes not only um, telling people to search for jobs online, but um, it, it involves thinking about what are some of the bad things that can happen to. So at the individual level, I actually want to answer this at the individual level. An important thing is issues of privacy and security online for individuals that they know how to use the internet wisely. Um, I think governments, uh, so I do some research on e-government, and one of the things that um, I think is a benefit, it, uh, things like open data portals where governments are intentionally putting out more information online and, and it can help with transparency and accountability. But it also introduces new issues for governments and how do you manage information? What should be out there? What shouldn't be out there? Um, you know, there are debates over whether some of this information should have been public or not. But, you know, there's some information online also um, that needs to be guarded um, for individuals' privacy and security for things like national security. So, in any event, you know, while this introduces new opportunities, um, there are new hazards as well, and that's why it's important for training for individuals, um, for them to really understand what they're doing online. Um, it introduces a lot of new questions for institutions in our society about how we use information and who should have access to it, too. So. You um, have given us a lot of information. Um, a little bit disappointing on where we stand for broadband connectivity within the county and especially within the inner part of the county. But more and more, and because of the internet, we are part of a global economy. Could you talk a little bit about where the United States stands relative to other countries in the world in terms of broadband connectivity? Um, so the U.S. is certainly not ahead in broadband connectivity and it's um, gosh I have not so these figures change from year to year but um, the last time I looked about a year ago we ranked about 14th um, you know it may that may not be completely accurate now I haven't looked it up you can look it up online but the OECD the Organization for Economic Cooperation and, and Development ranks countries on uh, the percentage of the population that's online, on things like broadband speeds, on prices, and again, in none of these areas is the U.S. a leader, even though the Internet was first developed here uh, through DARPA um, uh, in and, you know, we were at one time a leading nation in this area, but there are a number of countries, the Nordic countries. I had the opportunity to go to South Korea last year and to visit Seoul and give a talk on e-government at um, a Korean government conference. There are many of these countries have pulled ahead of us because they have more of their citizens online and more affordable and faster broadband. You mentioned before the cost affordability in other developing countries is lower possibly than ours. Could you share some of the reasons for that? Um, there's so one of the, uh, there's a study that was done by the Berkman Center at Harvard that looked at some of the reasons for the higher costs and some other possible models. Um, so Susan Crawford, who used to be in the Obama administration, has talked about the lack of competition in the broadband market here. And there are a number of reasons for that, but there tend to be only one or a few incumbent providers in many of the areas of the country, including in, in major cities. So there's 
really limited competition in terms of price or, or in terms of the speeds that are offered. Um, you know, it, it's not um, as vigorous a market as other parts of the economy. Um, also, in uh, some of the European countries, one of the models that the Berkman Center pointed to was that, um, and here I'm not an infrastructure person, basically the backbone of the network could be owned by one company, but that there was leasing to other companies. So the providers that consumers contract with, there would be more competition because they would lease that basic infrastructure from a company, but there'd be more competition on price or different packages, um, you know, uh, different speeds. But that's not the case here. In the US, we tend to have one company that does it all, and they're just one or a few in each market. Um, so the National Broadband Plan has called for having more competitive markets. Um, I think that's something that would help in this area, but you know, this is a structural problem. Um, you know, in the meantime, there are, you know, people who are without, and there's a need for, um, I think, other policies to help fill the gap for people. Thank you, Professor Mossberger. As a researcher, I certainly share the importance of surveys and data. But I wonder if you could share story, some stories, or a story, of where you feel the introduction of broadband specifically into a community has had impact. And may I ask you if you could address uh, one of our priorities here in Cleveland, and I think in Chicago and Tempe as well, which is the attempt to be a a, a, a green city on a blue lake and to look at our mm -hmm. sustainability initiatives. But it seems to me that, personally, that the use of broadband might create huge opportunities for us to advance that agenda as well. So do you have a story about how uh, silicon helps us go green? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> It's a good question, and that is a priority in Arizona. It's a desert city. There's a school of sustainability that I hope to work with uh, there. We have some colleagues in the School of Public Affairs working with them. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that's being done around smart grids right now in cities, um, not only across the U.S., but in cities around the globe. Um, how do you manage those grids? How do you use them more efficiently um, for individuals who are connected with broadband at home? There's the ability to monitor or dial down remotely. Um, you know, you're, well, I'm living in Chicago. You're, you're furnace to, but you know, air conditioning in Arizona. So there are things that can be controlled remotely, or people can monitor what the energy is that they're using online and adapt, uh, find out what times of day they're using more. Uh, there are so many ways that individuals, but also organizations and cities can try to manage their energy resources better. Um, there's actually, it was in Scientific American, a really cool um, example of some of the people who are at the MIT, uh, who, who are at MIT in, uh, um, doing work on digital technologies there, had worked with the city of Seattle to, um, to put sensors in the garbage, basically. And so when uh, they found out from that that waste was being uh, hauled clear across the country before that solid waste was disposed of, the city of Seattle um, thought about how they might reform the kinds of processes that they used and you know how to be greener basically so there's information you know the sensors um, all of the things that can be done with technology that can give us better information to to manage these kinds of resources um, look forward to seeing more of that Thank you for your remarks. Uh, all of the things that you're talking about mean more business for the software and, and hardware manufacturers. What participation are they making technically and financially to this project? Um, 
Well, there are efforts. So um, there are some efforts that the hardware and software manufacturers, I think there are probably efforts where donations are being made. There are a couple of things being done nationally. Um, for example, Connect to Compete is a new program that's rolled out to try to offer discounted broadband, at least to families who have children who are in um, uh, free or reduced school lunch programs. It's, it's a relatively new program. It doesn't affect everybody who needs uh, discounted broadband. There's a need also for people to have skills training along with that and to, um, to have um, refurbished computers or low-cost computers. It's something that the Federal Communications Commission has worked with actually one community, with nonprofits around the country, with some of the uh, people from the technology industry to try to address some of these issues. So I think that there are some efforts to do this. I think it's not enough necessarily to, to deal with the problem. Again, you know, this is an important slice of the population that's offline and that really needs broadband, but there are others as well. So um, I think there's an important role for people in the technology industry to do more. Um, as you mentioned, they benefit from this. Um, it's not just they, that they benefit, all of us benefit in society from this, but I, I certainly would uh, say that there's um, a need to do more. Professor Mossberger, thank you so much for your information. Um, I would bet that almost everybody in this room would love to be able to say that Cuyahoga County is the number one community for uh, community connectivity. Um, and it's disheartening to see how far back of the pack we are. Are there learnings from those markets that are ahead of us that we want to catch up to um, that we can hear from you that uh, could help us give us guidance around uh, their, how their funding, strategies, policy, anything that are resources and, and learnings that we could be employing ourselves? So if you look at the list of cities, you can probably, if you think about it, guess who's at the top of the list. So um, Seattle, Portland, um, uh, San Francisco, uh, there are some other communities as well. Actually Phoenix is fairly high in the list but it's not in the top few. There are places where there is um, a technology industry and in part that may be because of some you know, civic projects where they've supported people being online. Um, but it's not just the technology industry. We see that different partners, nonprofits, and, and the local governments in those areas have had a lot of initiatives. Seattle does a lot about civic engagement with technology and neighborhood inclusion, for example, and has for many years. So in, in part, it is influenced by the structure of the local economy. There's a pattern here. Seattle, San Francisco, and Portland versus Detroit and Cleveland and Buffalo. So, you know, there is larger structural issues, but it doesn't mean that communities can't do anything because we really see some activism around these issues in, in places like Seattle. I see it here, though, too. So I think that there's, you know, a lot of potential. There are a lot of people in the community here that have done some really exciting things, as I've mentioned, from what I've known um, about the initiatives in one community. Um, there are a lot of partners here, so I think there's potential. It means that neighborhoods, nonprofits, local governments, and the technology industry need to work together to um, try to bring together the resources to help people to go online. Um, I, and there's some nice examples in other cities. Hello. Oh. <laughs> 
Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Mossenberger. Thank you for definitely being um, our preliminary speaker for this series that's coming up. It was very enlightening. I'm Shalitha Mitchell, and I'm the board president of the Ashbury Senior Community Computer Center. And I am, um, I was just very um, enlightened by a lot of what you said. Um, one comment, and then two very quick questions. Um, the opening uh, a uh, question earlier from this gentleman actually asked about what are some of the initiatives. He brought up a great issue for the barrier, the financial barrier. You know, people cannot afford the internet access, so that's one reason of the broadband adoption being so low in our inner core. Uh, but I would just like to offer you and others who might have, have who might have that same concern that the um, one community network be a, a program. Uh, Connect Your Community or CYC have just been integral in increasing that um, broadband adoption rate within the inner core um, locally and even regionally and then um, uh, currently even with our Cleveland Metropolitan School District but I'd also like to go one step further and say that they even have a program where um, disadvantaged uh, individuals residents can actually obtain the internet for an entire year for a very low cost. Um, okay, and now my question, yeah, and that brought me to my question. So now, earlier in your dialogue, you mentioned some, some data, and then you said that you would like to refer us to the report. Um, I didn't get the report. You may have mentioned it at the onset, but if you could please uh, mention that report again, because I would like to follow up with that. And two, um, at the conclusion of your presentation, you mentioned an, uh, a rising of a rollout of gigabits networks. And could you explain what that is? OK. okay. Um, so as far as the report, it's available online at the One Community website. They commissioned the study, so if you Google One Community, and, and uh, you'll be able to find the report on the website. There's a summary. There are some key points in a table. You know, if you don't have time to read the whole report, which has tables and tables, um, so it's accessible on on the website. Um, uh, it, and gigabit broadband. Basically, it's the ultra fast broadband um, uh, of the future. There, so this conference was about, you know, what could we do if we had this kind of bandwidth that's many times over, you know, what's available today? How would we use it? You know, how does it matter? What are the applications? And I think this is just being explored by people as, you know, there's, um, as there are higher speeds you know, there are more applications for the internet. People have talked about this as internet two, um, and, and that it will look substantially different than, than what's available now. There were applications at this conference for emergency management, for remote um, um, monitoring for people with diabetes, you know, remote monitoring in the home of health conditions for people with diabetes and high blood pressure, um, using virtual reality to, and I think this was the um, Cleveland Clinic example, using virtual reality to, you know, sort of uh, carry out surgery to do a test run on, on surgery beforehand. So you can imagine that, you know, there are all these applications um, that are like almost endless, but basically it's very fast broadband. Ms. Mossberger, thanks so much for joining us here at the City Club. Um, this is the first in a series of conversations that are going to go on in the coming months, um, both here at the club and also online at the Civic Commons. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe the top three questions you would recommend our community grapple with together as we think through what our priorities are, what they ought to be, and how we can begin to, to, to actually address them. So the top three priorities, uh, the top three questions uh, that you should be grappling with. So I think one of the questions would be how can, um, how can the community work together? How can there be a partnership and a really vigorous partnership across 
sectors, business and government, nonprofits, community organizations, to really put this issue on the agenda. Um, because in my experience, it takes that kind of a coalition in a community paying attention to the issue to make sure not only that it's maintained as a priority, but so that there are the different partners in the room who can ask the right questions going on. Technology is always changing. And that's one of the hazards of doing research in this area. By the time I finish a study or we get a journal article written, you know, it's becoming a little outdated. There's something new always. But, you know, if you bring together the important actors who care about this issue, um, I think the question is who, sh who needs to be at the table and how to keep them involved in, in to sustain a coalition. That's kind of a multi-part question, <laughs> the three questions. Um, it, well, question two is how to get the resources to address the issue. And I think the answer for that needs to be across multiple sectors. That often, um, you know, nonprofit organizations are out looking for the resources. Um, but I think that, you know, sectors across the community have an interest in, in addressing this issue and contributing resources. And uh, a successful community would have that kind of partnership. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring Professor Karen Mossberger, the premier researcher in the field of the digital divide and access on the broadband in our cities. Thank you, Dr. Mossberger. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.